Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Lead More podcast. I'm your host, John T. Meyer. We just recorded, I will say, a, a dizzying conversation with David O'Hara, a professor at Augustana University. It, it was fantastic. We talked about the value of ancient languages, how we can learn from history and apply that to today. And then we also talked to David about what are the key elements of his class, how he thinks about and runs his class, and what should the classroom look like of the future? So all of that and more, you're going to learn some history from Mr. David O'Hara. Let's get right to the show. Well, we're here with David O'Hara, professor at Augustana University. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Um, you, let's see, official title, department chair of uh, religion department. That's right. Religion, philosophy, and classics. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Because I, I feel like you've, when I think about the classes, and I haven't taken a class from you, I wish I could someday. Maybe I can. Um, but you teach environmental studies, like on the side, yeah. classics, religion, philosophy. I mean, you are like a Renaissance man in my eyes. That's very flattering. I think of myself as a liberal arts generalist. Yeah. But you're right. Religion, philosophy, classics, environmental studies, a little bit of a uh, few other things, history and art. So. Yeah. And you've led J terms to various corners of the world. I know South America, Central America. That's right. And Europe as well. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And so, it, you know, I, I went to a liberal arts uh, school as well. And so you kind of epitomized what what makes liberal arts great in my eyes. Um, how long have you been teaching for? I've been teaching for 20 years now. Okay. And always at the college level? Did you teach in any other capacity? Well, I guess I've been teaching a little longer than 20 years. I, I've been teaching 15 years here at Augustana. I was at Penn State for five years before that. Okay. And before that, I did a lot of informal teaching. Okay. Um, and we were just talking prior to this about, I know that you're a big adventurer and now it sounds like your family is as well. I know you grew <laughs> up in Woodstock, New York. That's right. Yeah. What was it about your upbringing it's like you just said, I think it's a family thing. What, how did, did your parents model that? Or how did you become such a, a spirit for the, for the outdoors and the adventure? Well, I wish I had a simple answer, but it, you, you're probably right. Growing up in the Catskill Mountains was a big part of it. Sure. We only owned an acre, but in our acre, it was so heavily wooded, you couldn't see the next house over in the summertime. And I could walk for miles in any direction and stay in the woods, cool. crossing streams, climbing up and down trees and rocks and that sort of thing. So that was my playground when I was a kid. Yeah. So it wasn't like, you know, kids in the cul-de-sac. You probably had to entertain yourself or else your siblings as far as friends or. That's right. The one thing we didn't do is ball sports because there was no open field for us to play most of the time. It just wasn't flat or too wooded or. Too wooded. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Um, so what. What was a what was an adventure like then? What were you? Um, what type of hobbies did you have as a young kid? Uh, rock climbing, building tree forts, okay. uh, that sort of thing. One of my favorite memories is uh, my friend Michael McCabe, who's now a professional photographer. He and I would just go off and do the dumbest things. We saw this cliff that had been carved by the glaciers as they passed through the Hudson Valley. It's about three hundred and fifty feet high. And one day we said, "Let's climb it." which is completely stupid. I think we were probably about 16, no, like no prefrontal cortex involved at all. And we hiked through the woods a few miles and we climbed it. And I don't know how we survived the climb, but we got to the top of this thing and there to our backs is the Hudson Valley, this majestic vista, but also a 350 foot drop. Yeah. And there's, we happened to be in a place where there was one little trail and otherwise mountain laurel that you can't get through all over. It was, it was amazing. So we start down this trail, take two steps, and then between us, we hear a rattlesnake. And I, we, I look down and there it is like inches from my feet. Mike's on the other side of it. He looks down and says, run. <laughs> and he runs down the trail away from the rattlesnake. And I'm like, dude, there's a cliff behind me. There's yeah. a rattlesnake in front of me. What which, do I do? Which one's worse? Yeah. <laughs> so I froze. I just stood there for a few years or what felt like a few years. And eventually <laughs> the snake went away. But yeah, that's, that's kind of typical of my, my childhood adventures. Well, and I love that that, epit that story epitomizes the way I, you're an incredible storyteller and this this is like a memory from your what would you say 16 yeah and the vivid like, like the clarity in that memory is so great um nothing like a rattlesnake to really just you know, yeah. firm up a memory <laughs> <laughs> do you uh this is a, i don't i'm assuming so i don't want to generalize but it also often seems to me that professors don't as a young kid you weren't like i'm going to be a professor often it seems they have a passion and then they figure out how to put that passion into maybe a vocation or a career. Yeah. Um, tell me about, did you think you wanted to be a professor? You know, it's it, hindsight's twenty twenty, right? So I can look back and I can see points along the way where bricks were being laid that eventually became that wall. 
if you will. Mm -hmm. Uh, like for instance, I remember being about five years old and saying that I wanted to, um, to study law. Wow. And my mom asked me why. And I said, because I, we have lawyers in the family and they often use Latin phrases and I'm really intrigued by Latin. Now, I didn't wind up going off to become a lawyer, but yeah. I wound up becoming a classics professor, yeah. you know, studying and teaching Latin. And I, when I was uh, 14, I had a teacher, um, Mrs. Orza in, um, in my middle school in New York. She told me about Middlebury College and mm -hmm. how they had a summer language program and a graduate program in languages. And she said, you're really good. You should do this. And I wound up going to Middlebury. Thanks, Mrs. Orza. <laughs> we'll, send this her, we'll send her the link. Yeah, yeah. I just, I just wrote her a letter of thanks this year. I kind of lost touch with her and found That's out so that cool. she's, still, she's still kicking. She's doing great. That's and great. I and got in touch with her just to thank her for that. But um, yeah, so when I was 14, it, she gave me this pamphlet from Middlebury College and I was gripped with the possibility of getting a PhD and becoming a foreign language professor at 14. Uh, and wow. you know, that of course also didn't really turn out except that I now teach classical Greek. Along the way, I realized I don't really like teaching modern languages all that much, but ancient languages, I love it. And teaching languages that are, and learning languages that almost no one is using. Yeah. Like in Guatemala, I have some partners who um, they're from the Itza people, I-T-Z-A, Itza. Okay. Yeah. And the Itza language is nearly extinct. By nearly extinct, I mean, I know six people who are in their 80s whose parents only spoke Itza. Wow. And these folks back in the 1930s were forced to go to a Spanish speaking school and to use Spanish as the only language they were punished publicly if they hmm. used the, uh, the Itza language, but they still remember it. So that language is, it's this close to being gone. So how do you capture that? How can, how can we save that, preserve that? If yeah, six people. <laughs> you, you really can't, right? Yeah. So there are a couple other languages that are related to it. Uh, so it'd be like if Dutch were going out, but German were still sure. around, you yeah. know, that sort of thing. So you can, it's still around and everyone's heard of Chichen Itza uh, in, in Mexico, okay. those Maya ruins. So that's the Itza people. Yep. So they used to be this huge flourishing civilization. And that means that they've left their name and their words all over the place in the names of plants and animals yeah. and so on. So my son, who's a photographer and videographer, comes down to Guatemala with me sometimes and we interview Don Reginaldo, one of these elders, and just ask him, teach us something, yeah. anything at all. Whatever yeah. memories you got, tell us and we'll record it. And then we'll give that to your kids and your grandkids and anyone else who wants it. Is that a question you ask people, teach us something? Mm -hmm. It's a good question. Yeah. I sometimes I ask the little kids in that village, um, what do you know of the Itza language? And most of them say, no one speaks Itza. And I say, okay, but are there any words that you know that other Spanish speakers don't know? And they'll always have a few. Yeah, some phrases or some little yeah. colloquial sayings maybe. That's right. Cool. When I ask that question, I know that if the kids know one word in Itza, that means that that's a word that meant a lot to people in Itza and that didn't have an equivalent in Spanish. So for instance, they've got this word for belly button. Okay. And everybody knows they call the belly button the tuuch. <laughs> That's uh, great. Right? And what I want to know is why is the Spanish word for belly button not enough? And it's often the case that it doesn't just mean something like belly button, but it means the place where you're connected to other people. Uh, they've got this word sheesh, which I have not found a good way to translate. Yeah. And so I have a constant conversation. What do you mean by sheesh? Everybody uses this word to refer to things that get thrown away, but that still have some usefulness. Interesting. And I don't know how to translate that. So every time I'm there, I'm asking them, tell me more about sheesh. Yeah. So I think you maybe just started answering my question, but you said you love to teach essentially dead languages. Mm -hmm. What can we learn from these languages? Why do we need to keep studying? And then of course, teaching them. Well, I think that when we study an ancestral language, uh, usually I prefer the term ancestral rather yeah, than no, dead. Yeah, sorry, that was... No, no, that's okay. <laughs> I, I, I don't mind dead. Uh, I, I'm, I'm trying to encourage the, the, the idea of ancestral language. I think we get so obsessed in our society about the utility of, of, of something today, yeah. right? Like I think about how keyboarding was a big deal when I was in elementary school, and now I'm assuming it's not even taught because right. you know I watched my daughter navigate an iPad with no problem. She's four years old. She's not using the Mavis beacon no. you know, no. to learn how to type fast. Guam, how fast her Guam is. <laughs> so I kind of liken it to the, you know 
we, we very quickly are cursive, right? Like we yeah. move on from things pretty quickly if we don't find a utility today. Right, yeah. So I think we could ask, are our great-great-grandparents useful? And you, well, as soon as you ask that, you go, well, that's kind of a crass question sure. to ask. Now, they, now ask, are they valuable? Of course. Yeah. And why are they valuable? Because if it weren't for them, we wouldn't be here. Mm -hmm. And is there still anything that we can learn from our great-great-grandparents? Why do we care about our ancestry? It's not just about, you know, 23 and me, what's our genetics? Yeah. Uh, what are the, the illnesses that we might be able to prevent, that kind of thing. I think a lot of it is just understanding where we came from. A lot of it is also people before us have faced a lot of the same problems that we face. Mm -hmm. If we can watch them solve those problems again, we can avoid having to face those problems or we can build on those solutions and stand on the shoulders of giants. So learning an ancestral language, learning poetry, learning history and mythology, some of these things that seem very useless, they're actually like one of the best methods of compressing data. Mm -hmm. And if you can learn to unpack words, unpack poetry, scripture, uh, mythology, art, you'll find that there's just layer upon layer of meaning and value in there. It's a palimpsest of who we are. So. And so I feel like right now you're making the, the value proposition for the liberal arts education. And so what, what would you say to somebody who is um, kind of at a reflection point for education in our country today? Why right. go to a school like Augustana? Well, I think that everybody who gets an education, whether it's a formal education or an informal education, should learn how to do something with their hands. Let me just say that right at the outset. I like it. You know, uh, or, or learn, maybe not just with your hands, but learn how to do something with your body, with the gifts that you have, with who you are. That being said, the idea of the liberal arts, this is from an ancestral language, Latin. Yeah. Liber means a free person in Latin. And for the, the medievals, uh, the reason they called them the liberal arts is they wanted to contrast them with the servile arts. And the real question is, um, are you going to learn how to use and make new tools like a free person does? Or are you going to be a tool <laughs> like a servant is? So I think everyone needs to learn the servile arts. I think everyone needs to learn how to build stuff, repair stuff, and have that, that it's, a, it's a really rich feeling when you can f fix your own car, yeah. even if it's just changing your oil or sharpening your own pencil sometimes. Yeah. I mean, yep. you know, but uh, then if you can become that person like Henry David Thoreau, who invents a, a pencil, who figures out how to mass manufacture these things, that's pretty darn remarkable. Yeah. Uh, the liberal arts, I think, are about expanding the possibilities within you and not just letting somebody say, you know, you look like you could do this, therefore this is all you can do. Mm -hmm. I want somebody to, I wanna be able to look at my incoming students and say, you look like you could do this, I think you should probably try it. But by the way, I bet there's a lot more in you that I don't have the eyes to see. <laughs> so let's give you a whole bunch of tools to play with and let's see which one of, which of those tools really fit you yeah and some of them you're going to pick them up and say you know this is pretty cool but i could do better and i'm going to go boom let's take off in that direction then that's what philosophy has been doing for thousands of years and it's what most of the liberal arts have been doing yeah that sounds a little prescient today when i think about like ai and machinery and we're talking you know the service arts so now we're worried about all these things will be automated by machines but you still need a human to right. interpret to uh, well now we have this GPT-3 thing. Did you see that on Twitter? This is natural language, but... Um. You know, it's funny. One of the charges that was leveled against Socrates 24 centuries ago was that he made machines move around on their own, just like Daedalus did, and that he made ideas move around like those machines. Hmm. In other words, one of the reasons why the people of Athens put Socrates to death was that they were afraid that he had violated the ethics of artificial intelligence and that they already had a mythological precedent in the person of Daedalus that they could point to. Wow. So you study the liberal arts in part because, as I was saying, people in the past have faced a lot of the same problems that we have. They didn't have the same digital technology, but they were already thinking about the possibility. Well, and these, his, yeah, these historical loops, I think, of the, I mean, we can apply it to business, to, 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 to war, to geopolitical, like people won't stop saying unprecedented today with, right. with the COVID situation. Maybe it, is it 
maybe not as unprecedented as we think, or is it truly an unprecedented event? Uh, to some degree, there is very little that is new that is under the sun. Yeah. But I think it's still fair to call things unprecedented when we haven't seen them before. Yeah. It, it can feel unprecedented. But very often we call something unprecedented when we simply have forgotten the lessons of history. Hmm. I love taking students to Greece. And I'll, I'll spend many of my spring breaks and sometimes January in Greece with students. And we go around and we look at what's left. Uh, you could think of this in that Guatemalan term, the Itza term is shish. Yeah. Right? You go to the Parthenon, it's just, it's ruins, right? It's broken. It doesn't do anything anymore. Yeah. But there are so many lessons to learn from something like that, from, from the Parthenon. So, for instance, um, I talked to the woman who was in charge of reconstruction of the Parthenon. And she said when they lifted off one of the column drums a few years ago, about four or five years ago, they found that there's a, an olive wood block inside the column drums. So these column drums are, they're at, at the base, they're probably about four or five feet across. So these things weigh a couple of tons. Hmm. And somehow the ancient Greeks could get them, they could stack these column drums. That was building on previous technology. Before that, their columns had to be made of a single piece of stone. And before that, they were just made of trees. So they kept improving and advancing. So the latest iteration by the time of the Parthenon includes both the stone and the trees. Now, why is that? Well, they do, they do this because if you have earthquakes and it's a very seismically active zone, those column drums will shake apart. Yeah. Unless there's something resilient inside that can bounce them right back into place. And Olive Wood did that. She also said, we're pretty sure that they could cut marble twice as fast as we can cut it today and far more, uh, with far more accuracy. And we don't know why. <laughs> so we've got these, you know, these diamond tungsten yeah. bits that are power tools and we can slice through that marble pretty quickly. And she thinks they could still cut it better then. And one of the pieces of evidence, they lift off this column drum, 25 centuries old, this olive wood is still damp with olive oil. Wow. And it's bone dry all around, no water has seeped in. That's pretty remarkable. Yeah, it's incredible. So yeah, so I like taking students to these places uh, to see all these, as I said before, this palimpsest, this layer upon layer of history that we have still yet to unpack. There's so much that we have to learn by studying these, um, these liberal arts and it'll feel useless, Yep. right? Like, why are you going to Greece? Doesn't that feel like just some sort of frivolous thing? You know, you're going to go off and, you know, drink wine and have some olive oil and some good moussaka and baklava. <laughs> of course you yeah, are, you're yeah, right? Because sure. why wouldn't you? It's the Mediterranean. Come on, we're going to have a great time. But while we're there, we're also going to go to a, visit a, a monastery that's a thousand years old that's still functioning the way it functioned a thousand years ago. Yeah. Even if you're not into monasteries or into religion, you can look at something like that and ask, what makes an institution last for a thousand years and people still continue to use it. The buildings are a thousand years old and they're still being used. What are we building today that will last a thousand years? Yeah. And there's a leadership lesson there too, as we, as we think about how the world's gonna change and, and what does this mean and, and what's coming in the future and looking ahead, maybe picking up a book and looking behind is, right. the, is, the, is the where the lessons are. Mm -hmm. um, so I first met you in Sioux Falls because it was, it was you know, I'm not in the Augustana community, but all these people I know who are alumni just mentioned you as their favorite professor. And, oh, you got to take a class. And I went here, I went to Guatemala with him. And, I, and so how do, when you think about, you know, here we are in the summer getting ready for a new semester, definitely a different one. Different one. How do you think about planning your classroom? Why do people have such a unique experience? I mean, if you're listening already the first half of the show, you can understand the way you teach, but right. how do you think about your classroom as a leader? You ask a, a very pertinent question, and the best answer that I got for you right now is, I don't know. This, <laughs> I'm just going to say this feels unprecedented yeah. to me. <laughs> I haven't had to face this sort of thing before. Sure. And, uh, and I will say that lately I have been thinking about this constantly. What is it that I have been doing that I can carry over in a new kind of situation? Mm -hmm. I think my classroom, my teaching style consists of three things. Conversation, contemplation, and commentary. Okay. We have a conversation in the classroom. We show up and I say, here's a text that I want you to read that's about environmental ethics or environmental law or about classical Greek uh, ideas. Now I want you to go home and contemplate it for a while. And as you contemplate it, ask questions, write questions down, think through what else is connected to this. 
and then write some commentary. And university education for several thousand years has been built more or less on this model. People get together to converse. People spend time alone just pondering, think about those late nights in the dorm, mm -hmm. uh, either with a, a few friends or just by yourself, kind of scratching your chin. And then you write something down. And a lot of what we do, unfortunately, feels like ticking off boxes. Yeah. Right. We've, and, and for good reason. We've got ways of making things more efficient. So a lot of times, you know, you write that essay just because somebody told you to write that essay and then you hand it in. But I think of that essay as your commentary. It's you entering into this conversation uh, by saying, here's my contribution. My and now the cycle yeah. starts again, because now we have something else to have a conversation sure. about. So those are the three things that I want to preserve in my classroom. And the trick is going to be um, how do you do that? Most of my classes will be in person, more spaced out. I'm going to teach a lot outdoors. Yep. Uh, but some, what if some of my students get sick yep. and, and have to be away? Then I, now I've got to come up with a way to make sure that they are still involved and as involved and as engaged as before. And I want to make sure that they feel that the conversation, the contemplation, and the commentary are rich for them and real for them, taking them seriously, giving them tools to play with, so that they can say, I like this one, I can do better with this one. Yeah, I like that. So you've pulled those threads out of what you think every classroom should have, virtual or in person. What do you think the classroom should look like moving forward? Not just fall 2020, but right. beyond. And maybe what can history teach us there? Yeah, well, so uh, I think that, let me point to a different teacher, uh, Jesus. So I remember reading a book about his teaching style, which may sound like a funny thing to, to write about, but his teaching style, uh, Robert Coleman wrote a book called The Master Plan of Evangelism. And in it, he said, we have stories of Jesus teaching crowds, four or 5,000 people. We have stories of Jesus teaching a small cadre of people, which include his dozen students and then their followers, so maybe mm -hmm. three, four dozen people. And then just his disciples, those 12. And then among the 12, there's just three that he's really quite close with. So when he goes up the mountain of transfiguration, he's got those three with him. And then there's one who's described as the one he loved. Hmm. And I think that um, that model has shown itself to be really useful in all kinds of education and leadership as well. Uh, you know, there's some, something like a, a, a pyramid of hierarchy there, I suppose, although it doesn't necessarily have to be an administrative pyramid. Sure, yeah. But it's a pyramid of influence. So I think that a, a university classroom or any kind of professional training or education can have a similar model. There's going to be things that we do that reach thousands of people. This podcast, how many people are going to listen to this? We don't know, yeah. but it could be over the years, it could be millions, right? Sure, yeah, hopefully. Let's hope, fingers <laughs> crossed. Uh, but right now there's also one person listening to it. So you've got the whole yeah. spectrum. Mm -hmm. uh, and that one person who's listening right now, we're thinking about you. Yeah, right? and you, well, you just described the, the kind of the efficacy of a podcast, right? We're yeah. taking a one, the value of a one-to-one -one conversation, having a coffee and, and now scaling it in a way. That's right. And you know that the things that you write, the art that you make, uh, it, it will reach one person and then it'll meet, reach three and a dozen and several dozen and several thousand, and it's going to scale outward. That's what I think, big picture, what a university classroom can look like. Hmm. For me, one of the things, and you've probably heard this said about me, one of the things that really matters to me is tea. So in my office, I've usually got 40 or 50 kinds of tea. Mm -hmm. I've got one lazy boy, and that's for the students, because I want that, the student to walk into my office. The first thing they encounter, there's biscotti and tea on their left-hand side. And they know they don't even have to talk to me. They can just pour themselves a cup. And if they want to walk out then without saying a word to me, that's fine. <laughs> they can even keep the mug if they so want to. It's not to. even office hours. It's tea time. It's tea time. I want my office to be a place of refreshment. And if they want to come in and sit in that lazy boy and sip the tea, they still don't have to talk to me. They can browse the books on my shelves. I just want to offer them all these simple things that I have, these timeless and simple things that I have. And then if they want to talk, that lazy boy is theirs for an hour or two hours even sometimes because that one person really matters. And this is, John, this is extremely inefficient. <laughs> but students 20 years later will get back in touch with me and say, we had a conversation once over a cup of tea and that's changed my life and my business and the way that I teach. And I think success. That's so good. It's scaled out.
I, I, I didn't take many notes. I said, I just wanted to have a conversation, but I did write that down. I wrote down the word alumni because when I, when I, um, not only have I, you know, all these people said how impactful your class was, but I'll see you, you know, pre COVID times, of course, at a coffee shop having coffee or tea probably with mm-hmm. an alumni. And that's a pretty rare. I think we kind of lose touch with our professors and we move on and rarely do we write the thank you note. We, we're thankful, but do we express it? Um, is that something that you seek out? Do they seek you out? How do you keep such great ties with your students long, long after they're gone? Well, I think that um, I'm not in teaching for the money. Anyone who's listening, who's thinking about going into the teaching for the money, don't do it. Don't do it. Yeah. <laughs> Unless you've got some really good plan to become a law professor. Sure. Or, you know, computer science professor, maybe. Um, I think that the wealth that I have more than anything is the wealth of relationships. I've got relationships with the past. I've got relationships with people in Guatemala. Uh, and I have um, the unique privilege of being able to introduce people to one another. In the 1600s, there was a, a French um, priest and mathematician who taught at the University of Paris. His name was Marin Mersenne. And he's become sort of a, a mentor to, to me, uh, sort of a role model, yeah. you know, a distant mentor. <laughs> because Mersenne did very little uh, to change his discipline. He left us the Mersenne prime numbers. Okay, not particularly interesting to most people these days. Few mathematicians. The regular, like not the normal prime numbers? It's a, it's a different series of, of prime numbers. Okay. If anyone wants to look it up, it's M-E-R-S-E-N-N-E, Mersenne okay. primes. That'll be the after show. <laughs> exactly, yeah. I mean, you can put a link to it or something. Uh, but what Mersenne is remembered for is, there was a saying, if you want to tell Europe, tell Mersenne. Because Mersenne took other people seriously. So Thomas Hobbes, who may have been religious, but probably wasn't very, uh, when he had to flee the, the civil war in England, he went and found refuge with Marin Mersenne, hmm. a Catholic priest. Um, Galileo, who of course faced persecution from the Catholic church, yeah. found Mersenne to be a great friend and correspondent. Blaise Pascal, uh, Christian Huygens, and a whole bunch of other people all over Europe. So Huygens wrote was to like Mersenne. an influencer yeah. before they were. Oh, right. Huygens had... writes to Mersenne and says, I'm trying to figure out a way to, to scientifically keep time. No idea how to do this. And Mersenne says, so I got this friend in Italy, Galileo Galilei, who uh, he's figured out the regular oscillation of pendula. So I'm going to send you his research. And Huygens invents the, the, the pendulum clock. Wow. So Mersenne, what does he do? He's remembered all over Europe for the influence that he had on German philosophers, on French philosophers in the French encyclopedia, you know, and, hmm. and so on. Uh, he just thought it was important to connect people with one another. And you know what came out of this? Scientific journals. So sure. We didn't have scientific journals before then. Yeah. It was just correspondence with people like Mersenne. And now journals, academic journals and professional journals, are, they're basically correspondence. It's where you write a letter somebody who's going to need it, but you don't necessarily know who that person is. So you found somebody who can share it with everybody. That was Mersenne, just taking other people seriously. Sure. That makes sense. So some people might be listening to this point and be like, okay, this is this crazy professor guy. He seems pretty smart. Like, why is he on this leadership podcast? And I wanted you here because I feel like teachers are the most underrated leaders. And you mentioned, was it Mrs. Orza? Mrs. Orza, yeah. I think about Mr. Dierix in third grade who gave me a blank white book and made every, 20, every, every one of us an, an author. The assignment was to write a book. And, and these teachers, we, we don't often thank them or realize the impact until much later. And so, you know, I think of um, like Dead Poet Society, right? Like <laughs> Robin Williams maybe is like my idea. Oh, of Captain, like a, my Yeah, captain. exactly. But do you consider yourself a leader? You know, it's funny. I was just having this conversation with Adam Weber two days mm-hmm. ago, uh, the pastor of uh, Embrace Church here in Sioux Falls. And uh, both of us were in agreement. We're not the people to write leadership books. We're, we're both authors. <laughs> We've sure. both written multiple books. Sure. I, I'm not sure that I'm, if I am a leader, I'm not sure I'm the sort of person who could say, and here's how to be a leader. Yeah. I'm a teacher. But yeah, I suppose that if I look back over my own life, I have been led by good teachers and I feel a certain debt to pay that forward and to pass it forward. Probably one of the biggest things that I've learned from them is some of my teachers have lived in such a way that I've said, I wanna imitate that. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's the biggest thing that I strive for as a teacher, knowing that I'm not 
going to do it well all the time, but I want to live in a way that's worth imitating. Yeah. And that's the ethos of this show is that you don't have to have the title or be the proverbial model of a leader. I think you absolutely are and, and teachers are. So thank you for, for doing that. Thanks for um, saying so. Let's talk about, I want to shift to, because uh, we haven't got to talk about fish yet. And uh, we, need to talk we can about do fish. this, exactly. We can do this in your show notes, link it up. But you have you did a TED Talk uh, last year that, for the first right, time. Yeah. Give us the quick, uh, we'll link it up, but the premise of that TED Talk. Uh, the, the, it's pretty fascinating. The quick uh, point is that um, bear poop really matters because you find in bear poop the whole ecosystem. And whether you know it or not, your life is full of bear poop. Yeah. Not literal bear poop, but <laughs> something like it that doesn't seem very valuable, but that's actually really rich in connections. So ecosystems is ecosystems, really the so yeah. breakdown, kind of your thoughts on that. Uh, so, uh, yeah. So, I mean, uh, you, if you look at it. Why are they so important? Sorry, it was a weird lead, Yeah, like, yeah. Look question. at a satellite map of, a uh, satellite image of Alaska, which is one of the places where I work. I study salmon in Alaska. And you'll see dark green uh, in strands of dark green. The, start, the dark green follows the rivers. You might think, well, that's because that's where there's water. But I would say that's because that's where the fish are. And the fish are the way that the mountains swim back home. You know, mountains erode <laughs> slowly to the ocean, carrying all those nutrients out to the ocean. Salmon are born up in the mountains, and then they swim out to the ocean, and they collect those nutrients in their bodies and bring them back. And then bear and otters and ospreys and eagles and all sorts of other things drag those salmon out of the water and eat them uh, on the shore. And the salmon bodies decompose and the bear poop uh, and the, the poop of these other animals becomes these piles of, of uh, they're like little gardens. So as I'm walking along in Alaska, I'll find a pile, a pile of bear poop and it's got salmon bones in it, but it's also got berries in it. <laughs> the seeds of, of uh, many plants are indigestible. So it's like plants have this strategy. They go, hey, here's this nice strawberry. Would you like this? Yeah, yeah, and you go, me. yes, I would. It turns out we don't digest the seeds. Uh, we so just move them. We move them, yeah. right? And the, the, the fruit is the temptation that makes us move them. Dang. So that bear poop, the bear's gonna eat the salmon and the salmon is gonna be all those nutrients that used to live in the mountain that have just made their way back home after five, six, seven years. And it's gonna combine them with a bunch of seeds and then it's gonna wander a few miles from the river and it's gonna poop. And when it poops, every single time it does, it plants a new garden. Nearly every tree in Alaska grows in the body of a salmon. <laughs> That's pretty cool. And in fact, some researchers have found, found salmon DNA in the very tops of some of Alaska's tallest trees. Wow. Yeah. And my guess is you find a way to, to, to a story like that would come up in your Latin class. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Yeah. And how can, we, how can we connect those or why should we think about the way that those things are connected? Well, you think about uh, something like uh, democracy and pandemic. Those are both from Greek words and they both have the same root. They have to do with the deem which is the city, the population, the people. Group, yeah. Right? And something that moves through the city is a pandemic through all the city. Something that is just upon it a little bit is an epidemic. Yeah. And something where we're talking about the power and the rule of the people is the democracy, mm -hmm. right? And I'm, I'm in academia named for uh, a grove, an academe, a place of trees outside of Athens, but uh, where there was also a, a village. We can learn an awful lot by looking back at the stories of how our universities started, how our, our economy started, how our democracy started. And we can look even at some of the plagues and, uh, that affected ancient Athens yeah. and ask, what did the people do back then? What did they appeal to? What good decisions and bad decisions did they make? And how is it that the ecosystem that they lived in is still the ecosystem that we live in? Because if we acknowledge that, we can recognize that whatever was at, at play then is still at play today. And if somebody was tempted to say, make human sacrifice in order to stop the plague, it turns out that didn't work. And in mm -hmm. fact, oftentimes that just created a new pile of dead bodies, whether human sacrifice or animal sacrifice, which can be a new source of infection. But if people start to give one another a little bit of space, if they can open the city gates and allow people to get outside into the fresh air, if they can make sure that they're restoring their systems of food and water and so on, the plague vanishes. I'm not saying that we're exactly like a sure, city yep, of 40,000 yep. back yep. 2,500 years ago, but... But science turns out it's worth studying. That's right. <laughs> Let's go into, I like to do a little rapid fire here at the end. Good. And then I'm going to ask you about, you mentioned a couple, uh, you mentioned mentors, but I want to get some of your leader mentors in your life. Um, 
I know you're a writer. I know you're also a reader. What are you reading right now? I just got a book by, um, edited by Camille Dungy uh, called 400 Years of African-American Nature Poetry. I think it's actually the title is Black Nature. Okay. 400 Years of African-American Nature Poetry. Think about it. 400 years ago, we didn't allow African-Americans, whom we called slaves, to read or write. In other words, if they were doing nature poetry, this is how they were doing science, and they were singing it. Yeah, I was going to say verbally, but yeah, singing it, huh? Yeah, okay. that's right. Interesting. So that's what I, that's my my read this week, right? How now. deep is your stack usually, or is it kind of uh, when you finish one, you just decide to um, grab another one? I tr- well, my stack right now, I've got uh, about seventy books on the stack. I try to read about three hundred and thirty books a year. Oh my gosh! So give myself thirty <laughs> days off, but uh, read about a book a day. So now I got to ask about that. So what's the routine? Morning, night? I. Uh, yeah, I usually set aside about 45 minutes uh, a day for reading. And I, I should say, so, some people are going, there's no way he reads 330 books uh, a year. And that's true. Um, some of those books I read very slowly, like this book of poetry. Poetry deserves to be read slowly. Yeah. But if I'm reading a book on calculus or on physics, uh, something like that, I might read that super fast in order to get the gist of it. So now I have in my mind, if I want to look up something more about the physics of uh of laminar flow, I know exactly where to find it. I've already read through the table of contents and I've, I've skimmed every single page of that book and I know where, where it is and I know where it is on my shelf. So if you need a book rec- recommendation, tweet uh, at Davo. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, okay, so this is a good piggyback off that. We asked this question in interviews at Lemonly. Um, what is your superpower? What's the one thing you can do better than everyone else? Oh, um, I... Uh, yeah, a good question. I have a gift for learning foreign languages. Uh, I've never had difficulty in learning foreign languages. Since there's a switch that you can kind of, how many would you say you speak? Uh, f- well, fluently two or three. Uh, I can read in about 45. Wow. Yeah. And comprehend and, and obviously yeah. if you're reading it. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Um, you mentioned him once, but you have a son who I think also has that adventure spirit. He's he a does. photographer. He's traveled around the world. He's taken incredible photos. I don't know him that well, but he seems like a very confident, bold young man. Yeah. Um, what's a parenting tip you would give the listeners? Oh, so uh, I got to say my son, Michael O'Hara, I, I believe is the world's greatest photographer. So please do hire him. Um, Michael, You're good dad. <laughs> uh, with Michael and with all my other kids, I have three kids, Michael, Matthew, and Anna. The, the tip that I will give is you can weigh this for yourself. Rejoice in watching your kids do better than you do. <laughs> I love watching my kids grow. My son, Michael, he's a wilderness EMT. He worked for the National uh, Forest Service. He came with me to teach in Morocco and Spain this January. And he was my translator for Arabic. Wow. I think that's fantastic. Yeah. I have no trouble learning foreign languages, but my son speaks better Arabic than I do. That's great. Yeah. And, and I just, and he takes way better photographs than I ever will. And I think I'm a fairly good photographer. Yeah, you are. Yeah. Uh, so I just, I delight in watching my kids do better than me. And I apologize because I, I didn't even know you had other children. What do they do? So my daughter, Anna, is, uh, is, she's entering her third year of law school at Northwestern University. Mm-hmm. And uh, she also speaks better Chinese than I do. And <laughs> my, my youngest, Matthew, is uh, studying to be an auto mechanic. Okay, cool. Yeah. That's great. I think he's probably too smart for college. Yeah, he's just going to figure it out. He just sees the hands, working with his hands. Huh? Absolutely, yeah. Cool. What do you, um, you've mentioned a few things, so maybe it's one of the answers, but, uh, and especially I've been asking people in this trying times, what do you do to unwind, to unplug, um, yeah. kind of get rid of stress? Uh, for me, spending time outdoors makes a big difference and especially looking at small things. Ralph Waldo Emerson pointed out something that I think is still true. Most of us don't tend to look more than about 10 or 15 degrees above the horizon. Okay. So look up, look, turn your head at a different angle, look at things very small. I carry a magnifying glass with me everywhere I go. And I look at small insects and I look at the structures of the leaves. And there's just something about it. It's like, the, it's like standing in the shower, you know, where, you know, you, you, because you can't do anything else. Sometimes you have your best thoughts. Yep. Yep. For me, standing in the garden does that. Interesting. And what can you learn from small things that, uh, you know, what, what, what do you, how do you notice things that you may not otherwise notice if you step down and, and look at them? Um, one of the best things that I learned was from uh, Samuel Scudder, who was a student of, uh, of uh, Louis Agassiz at Harvard back in the 1800s. Um, Scudder learned from Agassiz that the pencil is one of the best eyes. So drawing what you see. That's good. 
Yeah, if you draw what you see, you'll discover that you are actually seeing much more than your brain realizes. Um, yeah, so yeah. I, I think trying to sketch, trying to observe, not trying to look for the useful, but just trying to look for the, the interesting and foster curiosity within yourself. Yeah, so you would probably argue everybody is an artist, right? I would, yeah. yeah that's great. Um, so let's get to, to leaders and mentors and uh, people that have shaped you because mm -hmm. uh, we all, I believe, are shaped by other leaders, whether they realize it or not. So who are a few of yours? Oh, I'm tempted to fall back on, uh, on teachers again. Uh, because obviously the, you know, you wind up in a discipline because people yeah. in that discipline. Which proves the you. point, right? Yeah. The teachers are leaders. Yeah. I had two history professors, one my freshman year, one my senior year, pardon Tillinghast, uh, taught me how to do history. And he taught us the life of St. Francis of Assisi. Go figure. Uh, and I found that probably not a week of my life has gone by since college that I haven't thought about St. Francis. Hmm. And I'm not from a religious tradition that really thinks about saints all that much. But Pardon Tillinghast got me thinking about the importance of history and the, the importance of, uh, of paying attention to how we live our life. Elizabeth Dorr, Pardon Tillinghast is, uh, has, has died, but Elizabeth Dorr is still alive. And she's another one of those professors that I just reached out to a couple of years ago cool. to thank her because I was a total jerk in her class. <laughs> she and I did not share political views. She, did, she and I did not share views of what history should be or what a history class should be. And I was livid when I got into her class and found out that we were not gonna be studying the things that I thought we were gonna be studying. Sure. So I argued with her constantly all semester long. And I thought, I don't care what this does to my grade. Yeah, what grade She's did you get? Wrong. I was gonna ask you that. Do you remember? I got an A. No, oh, there we go. <laughs> yeah, uh, and I think- So she had respected your opinion. I think she enjoyed the conversation, but I wrote to her, the, uh, I just, I said, I'm so sorry, because I think I gave you the hardest time and you didn't deserve it. And you taught me so much. Here's the thing. She taught me back in the 19, uh, late, late 1980s and early 1990s that we were engaged in civil wars in Central America. And I had no idea. And I didn't think it was all that interesting, honestly. Um, I came from a military family and I thought if we're engaged in a war, then we probably ought to be engaged in that sure. war. And since then I've gone to work in Central America and I've been welcomed into the homes of people who suffered during those wars, who have not judged me and who've not said, you're an American, you caused us a lot of suffering. People died in our country because of your people. Instead, they've said, welcome, here's a plate at our table. Here's a bed for you to sleep on. And uh, I just had, I had to write to, to Professor Dora and say, you were preparing me for something that I really <laughs> needed to be prepared for. And I'm so grateful and I'm so sorry that I made it so hard for you. Did you hear back from her? I did. That's great. Yeah. She was very kind. That's great. Anyone else that you want to mention? Uh, I'll just say in general, the people who do what um, both Friedrich Nietzsche and Eugene Peterson refer to as a long, a long obedience in the same direction. There's, you know, those people who commit to something for a long time, um, and I'll add that who commit to something for a long time for the benefit of others. Hmm. And, you know, there, obviously there are people who commit to something and who are willing to sacrifice others, but people who commit to something, parenting, grandparenting. Um, I, I love that. At my most mystical, I sometimes have this, this sort of reverie that we're all going to wind up standing before the throne of God someday and God is going to say, I'm going to show you all the people who shaped history, all the true leaders, and we'll be... We're like, oh, we're gonna get to see Napoleon. This would yeah. I mean, yeah. be interesting. All right, you know, and a whole bunch of grandmothers are gonna come out in front of us, and God will say it was them all along. Yep. They were the ones who shaped absolutely everything, who made everything possible, who kept you alive. They prayed for you when they could do nothing else, and that's why you're here today. And then we'll all just like start crying <laughs> and say, oh, "I'm so sorry." Just like me writing to Professor Door. Yeah, so, that's Professor awesome. Door, I hope you're listening to this. I really appreciate you. That's so good. Uh, so if somebody, we have your TED talk, if somebody wants to learn more about you or they're intrigued by your thoughts, you're a great follow on Twitter. How can we connect with you? Uh, I, I've tried to make links to most of what I've written on uh, my blog, which is Slowperk, S-L-O-W-P-E-R-C, from the Slow Percolation of Forms, okay. which is the title of my dissertation. Slowperk.com? Slowperk.com. Yeah. Great. Well, thanks for the conversation. Thanks for being here. Thank you, John. All right, that was the Lead More podcast with our guest, David O'Hara. I wanna hear from you. What was the most interesting part 
of that episode. I know there was something that had to jump out, something new you probably didn't know before. So send me a tweet at John T. Meyer with what your favorite lesson from history or from David O'Hara was in this episode. And of course, thanks for listening. <laughs>